Welcome all. I've titled this sermon, Barabbas. And uh, I believe the story of Barabbas is relevant for our time. So before we begin, let's ask the Lord's presence. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you will grace us with your presence. May your Holy Spirit enlighten us. Lord, your Bible is so full of tremendous themes. There are so many lessons hidden in every single one of them. Help us to find them as hidden treasures. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 3, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, which we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which we have not accepted, ye might well Bear with him. That's rather a sad statement. So according to Paul, it is quite possible to preach another Jesus. According to Paul, it is quite possible to preach another gospel. And the sad part is that they are well able to bear with him if somebody preaches something contrary to the Bible. So we can have another gospel, we can have another Jesus, we can have another spirit, and the people are quite willing to receive it. That's a very, very sad statement. Another Jesus. Well, if we turn to the Bible and we read the story of Jesus and his trial, then we are confronted with a terrible choice that had to be made. A choice between two individuals, one by the name of Barabbas and the other one by the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you turn to Matthew 27, verse 16, and you read it in the NIV version, then it says, at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas, Barabbas. Of course, the King James doesn't say that. It says Barabbas. And the NIV didn't always say it either. In the 1984 version, it says, at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? That's the 1984 edition of the NIV. But if you go to the 2011 edition, it says, at that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Now, that translation is based on the writings of Oregon, in the opinion of many. And uh, personally, I would not trust the writings of a Gnostic, and nowhere in the King James will you find Jesus Barabbas, and nowhere in the Spirit of Prophecy will you find Jesus Barabbas. But it's an interesting thought, because if you take the word Barabbas, Barabbas means Bar Abbas, which means son of the father. Or you could translate it, if you like, if you wanted to say that God is the Father, then this would be Son of God. And Jesus, of course, was the Son of God. So we had two individuals 
with very similar names. Whether it went as far as incorporating the first name as well, Jesus Barabbas or not, is not really relevant. Personally, I think it wasn't there, but even if it was, it wouldn't change much. They were faced with a choice between two sons of the father. Now, it is interesting that they went further. When they received a resistance from Pilate, they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Because Barabbas was a notorious robber and murderer, and Jesus, by the very examination of Pilate, was found to be without fault. Echo homo, behold the man. He had no fault. He was blameless. Which one can convict me of sin? Nobody raised their hands. The only sins that they could come up with were sins of tradition breaking. But not a single one of God's word. Because Jesus was sinless. In him was no guile, no sin, the sinless Son of God. Now this Barabbas represents another individual that was more acceptable to the Jewish leaders than was Jesus of Nazareth. They had a choice between two sons. And it is interesting that both of them claim to be the Messiah. Jesus had publicly announced his Messiahship to the woman at the well. He who is standing before you is he. When she said, I know Messiah will come. And Barabbas had also laid claim to being the Messiah. Now, when you look up the verses in the Bible regarding Barabbas, there are many of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all refer to him. In Matthew 27, verse 16, we read, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. He was notable. Jesus was also notable. They were prominent figures. They were known figures. 27 verse 17, Therefore when they had gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus which is called Christ? We know what their choice was. Matthew 27 verse 20 is very enlightening. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Just let that run through your mind. Where did the instigation come from? Who were those that persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus? It was the chief priests and the elders. If we had to put that in the modern context, then we could say it will be the bishops and the cardinals and the priests and the pastors that ask for Barabbas. Matthew 15, verse 7, And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection and with him who had committed murder in the insurrection. He was a murderer. He was a murderer. He was also a liar because he said he was the Messiah, but he didn't fulfill the biblical criteria. So he was a, a liar and a murderer. And if we go a little bit further, we read that he was a robber. He was a thief. Then cried they all again, John 18, verse 40, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. 
Now, Barabbas was a robber. So he was a liar. He was a thief, a robber, and he was a murderer. And Jesus had accused the Pharisees that their father was the devil. And the will of their father they would do. And he was a liar from the beginning and a murderer. So the one represents the attributes of Satan and the other one represents the attributes of God. And when the church had to make a choice, they chose Barabbas and instigated through propaganda that the crowd should ask for Barabbas. They went further. They stated, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. When faced with civil obedience over divine obedience, they chose civil obedience. They chose to be subject to Caesar rather than subject to God. Because Jesus had accused them, why do you want to kill me? Which is contrary to the law of God. Because there was no reason to kill him. He hadn't transgressed any law that was in the scripture. Only their creed, their traditions, their laws that they had accumulated over time. They chose civil obedience and rejected divine obedience. My question is, will we be faced with a similar choice today, and will these choices be influenced by our understanding of the gospel of salvation? Is it possible that someone can sell me another gospel? Is it possible that more than a billion Christians can believe that Jesus never died for them and that they will have to pay for their own sins in a place called purgatory. Is it possible that there could be such a creed and that the only way to salvation is to receive a sacramental system which is offered to us by the prelates and the church? Is that possible? Are we expecting a millennium of peace in an earthly setting or in a heavenly setting? Are we expecting universal conversion or are we expecting judgment and separation of the sheep and the goats? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. What is our gospel? Is there a judgment coming? Or is there a kingdom of God that is going to be erected the seven mountains? Here on this earth. And then we will rule the world with our system, with our creed. The way the truth and the life was rejected in favor of Barabbas, a false son of God, a false Messiah, a false person, an imposter in the place of Jesus Christ. He claimed that he was the Messiah. He did more than that. He claimed to introduce a new order of things. He was going to change the order. He was going to put the church in control and drive out the heathen. Do we have a similar ideology in the world today? Is there a movement, for example, in Christian countries to reintroduce a Christian state and a Christian set of laws? Is it possible that even in countries like the United States, they want to change the Constitution so that the church once again could rule and that the priests and the prelates and the pastors could exercise their so-called God-given authority? Is it possible? And if someone then curtailed 
that enthusiasm threw cold water in their face and say, that's not what the kingdom is going to be like. Is it possible that they would say, away with him, this man will destroy our creed? Give us Barabbas? So what did they fear? What did the Jews fear? They feared the loss of the kingdom and their creed. And therefore they said, it is better that one man die for the sake of the people than that the people should die for the sake of one man. Get rid of him. Our power as priests, our position in society will be questioned and will be worth nothing if we accept this man. Away with him. We want a seven mountain theology. We want to build the kingdom of earth, of heaven on earth. That is the official position of the Roman Catholic Church, amillennianism. The church rules. That is the position of conservative Protestantism, amillennianism. The church rules. And the rest, they want the kingdom down here. For a thousand years. But God said, my kingdom is not of this world. And the Bible tells us when he comes, they will hide themselves in the rocks and in the dens and in the caves. And as lightning is visible from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. But no, they want another kingdom. They want it down here. The Bible talks about the millennium of death where there's nothing down here. The redeemed meet the Lord in the air and are taken away. The kingdom of God is vastly different to the kingdom that the Jews wanted and it is vastly different to the kingdom that the world wants today. Jesus came to show the character of the Father. He showed what it was like to live in obedience to God's word. He rebuked the creeds and traditions of men. In vain ye worship, preaching for, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. You set aside the law of God for your tradition. In vain you worship. It is an incredible battle when you are faced with a creed. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that you should walk in them. Colossians 2 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in them. If we read other verses, it says in many places, you ought to walk and to please God. 1 John 1, 7, walk in the light. John 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. There are two ways. The one is the way of God, and the other one is the way of the creed. And a creed is powerful. If the creed supersedes the word of God, it is almost impossible to plant the word of God where a creed has overgrown the field. Just take your own examples. Let's say you discover a great biblical truth whatever that may be. Let's say you discover adult baptism in the Bible and you try to sell that in the time of the Reformation. They would drown you, kill you by the thousands because it clashes with the creed which wants church and state to be united. And just as you are registered at your birth as a citizen of your state, 
So you were registered at your birth through baptism as a citizen of the church and the two were united. But an adult baptism would draw a line and only those that have been convicted of the truth of this kingdom would become part and parcel to the exclusion of the state. What if you discovered the Sabbath truth? And you go to your friends and neighbors and your family and you tell them, I have discovered the truth in the Bible. Let me show you that the law of God is not abrogated. As his custom was, Jesus' custom, he kept the Sabbath day. You come into opposition with a creed. And the creed is so powerful that they have to reject the word of God because the creed has been elevated. Barabbas is a type of Satan. And Barabbas promises a new world order where the church will be all-powerful and rule. Therefore, obedience to the church is a prerequisite. Because only if you are obedient to the church do they have rulership. They have power to rule. They have authority. And if you do away with the law of God, as Satan has managed to do and managed to convince many of the churches to do, then you have to replace it with a creed. And if you dare cross the creed, you will be a lawbreaker, not of God's law. But as verily as they chose Barabbas, as verily they will choose him today. Satan had an opportunity to exhibit the result of the working out of the principles of freedom from all law, and Christ, by his unswerving obedience to his Father's commandments, made manifest the result of practicing the principles of righteousness. The choice was between a robber, a murderer, and a thief, and the unspotted Son of God. Humanity chose Barabbas. The cross had been prepared for Barabbas, but Jesus was nailed to it. Just let that sink into your minds. It had been prepared for Barabbas, but Jesus was nailed to it. He fell under the burden of sin. He was beaten inhumanely, found innocent and beaten. Can, can you imagine that? Twice. Why did Pilate have him beaten if he said, I find no fault in him? That's like going to a court of law. They find you not guilty and then beat you to a pulp. Is that justice? He did it to invents sympathy. He tried to use it as a ploy. But the crowd clamored under the instigation of the priests and the elders for Barabbas. The one who had claimed to be a Messiah. I read that from the book The Desire of Ages. Is there another power on earth that like Barabbas says that it is another Messiah, another representative of Jesus Christ, another God on earth? Is there a power that has frequently, like Barabbas, asked for a new world order to be introduced into the world where nationalism will be removed and everybody will be subject to a central power ruled by a moral entity? Is there a Barabbas in the world today who claims to bring about a great reset? Is it possible? Who has attempted to do this? Where in the newspapers do you read about such a power? 
We must remember that we are still in the very same world where Jesus was rejected and where an imposter was chosen in his place. We must remember that we are still living in the same world where the masses were deceived by the distorted preaching of the priests and prelates, by their constant propaganda against Jesus. And we have to ask ourselves, can the same thing happen today? Is there a Barabbas? And will the choice again be placed before humanity? Choose. Barabbas? Or Jesus. The people of Israel had made their choice. Barabbas, the robber and the murderer, the representative of Satan. Christ, the representative of, of God, had been rejected. And in making their choice, they accepted him, whom from the beginning was a liar and a murderer. We are faced with the same choice. They say we have no king but Caesar. Is there a power today that claims the title of Caesar? The title of Caesar was Pontifex Maximus. Is there a power on earth that claims the title Pontifex Maximus? Yes, there is. This title came with a special edition that the one who held it was also a god and had to be obeyed absolutely like a god and had to be worshipped. In the book of Revelation, we read that they worshipped him. This power that represents the mark of the beast. Isn't that an incredible coincidence? So when the crowd shouted, we have no king but Caesar, is there a Caesar today with the same title who also claims to be a God on earth, to be a Messiah and to give you salvation through sacramental systems and creeds contrary to the word of God? Your righteousness comes through works of obedience to the church as opposed to the righteousness of Christ, which is embodied in obedience to God's precepts. The choice is identical. Barabbas or Jesus. Jesus Christ fulfills every prophecy in the Old Testament regarding himself. Jesus Christ lived an exemplary life. He did not come to abolish the law, but to uphold it. Not one jot or one tittle would disappear from the law. He crossed their creeds. He crossed their rules and regulations. But he kept the law of God. He, the creator God, came to his own, but was not received. Barabbas is the usurper. And this usurper in antitype that lives today, the Antichrist, was also prophesied in the Bible. And the reformers had the courage to identify him in the Bible. They found the criteria in the Bible and the listing of his characters so compelling that they had no doubt and with one voice proclaimed that it was the system that is alive and well and living in Rome today. Another Caesar, another son of the Father, another Messiah. Christ brings moral excellence and enmity against sin. Barabbas brings moral decadence and enmity against God's law. That's our choice. Satan distorts the character of God. He has painted the justice of God as being tyrannical. Whereas in actual fact, he himself is the one who is tyrannical. 
He has painted the mercy of God as weakness, whereas the mercy of God is strength. He has kind, painted the kindness and the benevolence of God as selfishness to solicit worship. But he's the one who solicits worship, even from the Son of God. I will give you everything if you bow down and worship me. He has such a distorted character. And the Bible says, that humanity will follow the dictates of the modern Bar Barabbas. Though he was rich, he became poor for our sake, that we through his poverty might be made rich. It is a sad faith that humanity cannot find truth when it is buried in tradition. Humanity cannot find truth if it is buried in a creed. That is why we as Protestants should say we have no creed other than the Bible. This is our creed. If it's not in this book, it's not part of our belief system. We have no creed. A creed would destroy the gospel as verily as the creed destroyed the priests and the prelates of old. In vain you worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, the traditions of men placed above God. So this was Christ's mission and it is our mission today. And these two mindsets will clash constantly. We find this contrast right throughout the Bible. We can find it in the very beginning. We can find it in Cain and Abel. And then we find it again in Jacob and Esau. And then we find it again in Moses and Korah. And again in David and Saul. In Hannah and Penaniah. In Jehoshaphat and Ataliah. In Jeremiah and Hananiah. In all the prophets of God and all the prophets of Baal. There was a constant clash. We have to be convinced in the heart. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If we turn to Revelation chapter 13, we have a description of these powers. We have read it so many times, but to put it into the context, we read that the second beast of Revelation will do great wonders and that it will, will deceive those that dwell upon the earth and that they must make an image to the beast and that they must give life unto the image unto the beast and that they must cause, that is by legislation, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. They want their system. They want their system, their religious system that rules over the world. And if you affront, if you are an affront to it, you have to be removed. It is better that the affront be removed than that their kingdom should be destroyed. It is better that one man should die than that the kingdom should die for the sake of one man. And they will force you to receive a mark in the right hand and in the forehead. And this mark in this right hand and in the forehead is the mark of the beast. And the beast, which is Catholicism, which all the reformers agreed to, says it is a mark of my ecclesiastical power that I have transferred the, the Sabbath to the Sunday, from the seventh day to the first day of the week. It's not about the day of the week, it's about my authority. And this is my creed. And never the mind that the Bible says something else. My creed will stand, and anybody who opposes my creed, I will destroy. And humanity, at the instigation of the priests and the prelates and the pastors of the world, will say, give us Barabbas. 
It's a mindset. Revelation chapter 17 from verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but received power as kings one hour with the beast. The world rulers will unite with this religious system. And then it says, and this is so important, these have one mind. They have admired the beast. They have wandered after it. They have swallowed its ideology. They believe every word that comes out of its mouth, no matter what. If we don't watch what comes out of its mouth and if we don't see that it leads to servitude and bondage, we will never understand. They have one mind. They've come to think like it. They've swallowed the creed. They've drunken the wine of fornication, the false doctrine of Rome. And the consequence, just like Cain and Abel, verse 14, these shall make war with the Lamb. So here is one mindset. One mindset. But there's another mindset. Romans 15, verse 6, that ye may be one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With one mind and one mouth, we should glorify God. Philippians 1.27 Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Or what about Philippians 2 verse 2? Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. How important is it that we be of one mind? Who has sown all the tares amongst us that we should be so at variance? Every wind of doctrine blowing amongst us, how can we be of one mind? Concentrate on the essence of the gospel. Concentrate on the message for our time. Concentrate on present truth and come into harmony with each other. We have to reflect the character of the Son of God. If we read in Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. If we have the same mind as Jesus, then the creeds which are contrary to the law of God and the word of God will be as abhorrent to us as they were to Jesus. And what about the characters and the way in which God and his adversary enforce their doctrines? Jesus says, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. That's why there's a cross. There's a path to choose. And the path is between the two, choose. One mind. To be a compelling power is found only in the government of Satan. Nowhere else. Any form of compelling is not from God. Any form of force is not from God. God will draw. God will not drive. God is the good shepherd. He walks ahead. The sheep follow. Not in the other system. He walks behind with a whip and he drives them to where they're supposed to be. Worldly wisdom will not save us. When I was an evolutionist, I had much worldly wisdom. 
In fact, I had so much worldly wisdom, I was a professor at the university with that worldly wisdom. That worldly wisdom has become foolishness to me. Foolishness. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And John 6 verse 57 says, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. We have to internalize his character. Christ was appointed to the office of mediator from the creation of God, set up from everlasting to be our substitute and surety. And the world chooses Barabbas. Coercion, force, is the way of Cain. It is the way of Satan. And if we look at what is happening in the world, how we are heading towards a system of force and coercion, then who do we want as Lord and Master? When Jesus was on this earth, there had never before walked a man on this earth that had such enmity towards sin, and yet he became sin for us. The sinless, spotless Son of God came to this world to redeem sinners like you and me. So what is the secret of unity? That is my question today. Because even in, God's, in the midst of God's people, there is disunity. They are arguing about the silliest things. This one has this doctrine and that one has that doctrine. And we argue about things that are so deep that humanity cannot even understand them. The answer is, there is no lording or no superiority of attitude. No papal coercion amongst God's people. Let me read you a quote from First Selected Messages. Then as the children of God are one in Christ, how does Jesus look upon caste, upon society distinctions, upon the division of man from his fellow man because of color, race, position, wealth, birth, or attainments? The secret of unity, and I want you to listen carefully, the secret of unity is found in the equality of believers in Christ. That's where equality lies. No lording it over anyone. No coercion. No superiority. No rules and regulations which are not in harmony with the word of God, but which are a substitute and become part of a creed. May God preserve us from a creed. May our choice not be between a creed and the truth. May our choice not be between Jesus and Barabbas. In Colossians 3 verse 23, we read, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. As to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect of persons. We're all in the same boat. Acts 20 verse 19 says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. I'm afraid we are heading for that time. We're going to face a time of tears, we're going to face a time of temptation, and most of it will come from the brethren, from the priests, and from the prelates. And they will use the media, they will use every means at their disposal to convince us to choose Barabbas. But as for me and my house, I want to serve the Lord. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a terrible choice. And humanity is walking over the same ground and is as willing today to make the same choice as they made in the time of Jesus. But even in the time of Jesus, Lord, not everyone chose Barabbas. And some that even did repented. And in that first outpouring on that one day of preaching, 3,000 were added to the church. And that was a droplet of the early rain. May the latter rain be more abundant. May millions turn from Barabbas to the living Son of God. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.